Well, welcome to this month's Money Makers Club meeting. It's uh, unusual that we have it on two different days, but that's just because of my teaching schedule. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had been teaching on Tuesday nights, but now I'm, I'll be teaching uh, Thursday and Friday, well, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday nights this fall. So my Tuesday nights was free. That's why I had Money Makers last night at South. And then um, Wednesdays should be all right for the daytime meetings here to again accommodate different schedules. So uh, welcome. Basically, uh, for those of you that haven't been to the meetings before, uh, Money Makers Club is totally student driven, which is great. So all the topics we talk about are ones that our actual members talk about. Uh, we're an officially um, chartered club here at FSCJ, so we are the official investment club. Uh, one of the newer clubs, we actually got our, our school charter in December of 2019, right before COVID. <laughs> So we used to meet every week, actually. So we would actually go get lots of trades. Um, but since COVID, we we meet once a month. Oh, welcome. Uh, there's a sign sheet and the handouts are in the back. Thank you so much. So and uh, and the students asked sponsor for the club. So um, my job is to make sure that any of our educational handouts are legit, and and I, I prepare and make copies for those. I help book the rooms for the club. Uh, which is nice. We actually had all of our officers graduate last fall. So right now, all of our officer positions are open. Uh, I think I had an interest for president, but I haven't heard back from, from her recently. But uh, we have four positions, uh, president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. So if anyone has an interest in being a volunteer officer for a pretty cool club, just let me know. Uh, there's, there's no criteria. You don't even have to have experience. You just have to be willing to attend the meetings and fulfill the role of a particular officer, like represent us at club fairs or recruitments, things like that. Uh, Secretary just keeps track of the membership list, and the treasurer helps us spend whatever funds we get from the college. Uh, really, the only funds we have is for food. So we still have time for the rest of the school year through the summer. Uh, and yes, I, I made sure that we budget for food. So in the future, hopefully we can have some food to eat uh, for the club and see the treasure to actually go out and spend our money <laughs> to buy some food and, and actually order it well enough in advance to, to eat with. So that's that's a nice, nice little perk to increase membership. So uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, again, I'm a faculty sponsor. I teach uh, four different types finance classes here at the college and other business classes too, but mostly finance. Uh, I, I invest every month uh, since I was a kid in school, actually. Also an active options trader as well. So I always uh, look at the markets, always look at news differently from the perspective of if it is something that will help me make money, then I'll pay attention to it. If it's fluff or politics that don't really Help me make any money, then I can easily ignore it. All right. Well, good. We have someone online. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Great. Let's notice in the chat box. Looks like uh, you're able to hear us fine. So, uh, those of you that are online, uh, if if I have your email address, which I probably do, since you have received the link to the session, then uh, I always email all the handouts from all the meetings to you so that and, and also uh, for all members we also have an educational word document which has links to books websites um, video resources so that way you can always teach yourself how to build wealth on your own that's one of the best things about the club um, first of all the fact that it's totally student driven is that we, we always try to provide as much information as we can to empower you to build wealth on your own without having to face someone else to do it. You shouldn't have to face someone else to manage your money. You should be able to manage it on your own. And those, these are the types of tools that we try to give all of our students every month in our meetings uh, with all these different handouts. So one of the next items on our agenda, since we always try to keep it an hour, is are there any topics that, and including our visitors on the stream, 
is there any any topics that you've been interested in learning about with trading or investing that maybe I could create a handout with for a future meeting? You mentioned Roths and what's my RA? Oh, Roths. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I'm going to write it down on the attendance sheet. Different ideas. So, yeah, it's actually probably my favorite investment vehicle because of the fact of its great tax benefits. I only wish that the amount that you can contribute into a Roth wasn't capped, but there's a limit. The limit is smaller for Roth versus, say, like a 401k or a regular IRA. But yeah, Roth is great. I need, I need to make my Roth contribution still for this time of year now that, now that you reminded me. So yeah, Roth IRA, good one. Um, any other topics that come to mind that um, wanted to know about investing or trading that would make for a good topic? Talked about, um, I think I asked you one time. There's a Vanguard, it, it's making a little more sense now. But then there's Vanguard, like which air, which platform you go into. You go, oh, yeah, so you go through Vanguard, you go, which one doesn't charge you so much? Yeah, so low fee or no load, uh, IRAs. So Vanguard's actually a good example. So Vanguard, Fidelity, those are probably two of the lower fee ones. But I always encourage you if you're if you're trying if you're going to a financial institution to set up uh, your own 401k or IRA, for example, always go with the ones that have the lowest or lowest rates. Because that way you get most of the money back to you. Yeah, that's definitely something I could uh, come up with for the future. Quant funds. Okay. Yeah, we haven't had quant funds uh, talked about, but that's actually interesting. We have talked a little bit about of hedge funds, both in the club and in the class, uh, but quant funds are, and, and, and how we get in quant funds, because depending on the funds, some of them have a minimum uh, threshold for investment. So, uh, in, in the hedge funds in particular, but the quant funds, I don't know if they're going to invest. That's a good one I should, I should take a look into. Any other ones? Maybe different. Now, God forbid something happens, you want to put in, like, you know, when you pass away, like, what do you call it? Um, yeah, I guess what I forgot. Beneficiary, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, lot of like, your 401k, they always have you designate a beneficiary of who gets, like, if you pass away, who's going to get your 401k? Yeah. yeah. And you, have to fill form for you don't have a 401k, but you have the Roth, IRA, and other stuff. You know, in these investment accounts, you can restrict a person to, have it in your, or is that a separate thing? That's like, oh, the, yeah, there's a form where you could designate percentage or who gets it. Yeah, there because you don't want if you're in that car accident, all that money just goes out. So yeah, you, you don't it. want you don't want the state, uh, the state to decide where it goes. So it's definitely good to have it documented specifically who you want. And they do have here. that form in yeah. their platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, yeah, all the big firms usually do. Even your work 401ks will have it. Then. Beneficiary designation form for you. They actually want you to fill those out. It's a good one. REITs. Yeah, that's something I'm interested in and I understand it, but. Yeah, we, we haven't talked about, talk about it together. Yeah, we haven't talked about those in a while. I think that's a good one to bring back up to a future meeting. Because we talked about what they are. Uh, and gave some examples, and I have, have an older handout, but it, it probably warrants an update, actually. So that's a, that's a really good one, because I've liked REITs for uh, many years myself. Yeah, I'm curious as to how they put it together to find there's a There's a couple of different buckets or types. You got the ones that actually will invest in commercial and residential real estate, but then you have the other REITs that'll invest in commercial and or residential mortgages. So some of them will do the loans or invest in the loans. Some of them will actually invest in the properties and uh, and some of them will invest in different types. So yeah, there's, uh, there's some varieties on, on uh, for me to create a handout. 
uh, explaining the differences between each. That way you get a better idea of which ones are more attractive to invest in. So very, yeah, really good topics. Uh, what the market's been doing lately? Well, right now we're in the midst of earnings season and some of the biggest names and companies are actually announcing their earnings just this week. We just had uh, Visa, Alphabet, Google, Microsoft, uh, Apple's coming up, Amazon is coming on Thursday. Uh, we had Boeing that announced their earnings. I think um, so. There's uh, several that are. Hey, come on in. We just got started. There, there's a sign sheet in the back, and there's some handouts too. Thanks for coming. So yeah, earnings season is going on right now, and uh, and right and also the Federal Reserve has uh, some juggling to do. They decided not to raise interest rates this month, but with inflation being still high and still sticky, we all feel how bad inflation is. Every single thing we buy is more expensive. And even though inflation is just under 4%, it's still about double where it should be, or still about double where we have been accustomed to living at for a dozen years. From 08 to 2020, when COVID hit, we, were, we had inflation about between 2 and 3% really low. So a whole generation of people have not experienced inflation the way we have over the past year. I mean, last summer inflation was like oh, was 9% and 9% last summer. And and uh, the Federal Reserve has had to raise interest rates so many times over the last year and a half. Uh, double digit interest rate increases just to try to combat inflation. And it's a two edged sword. It's, it's, it's tough when Federal Reserve raises interest rates, it helps bring inflation down. But at the same time, when Federal Reserve raises interest rates, all of our costs for borrowing, credit card loans, car loans, especially home loans, all goes up. And corporations' profits can go down because their cost of borrowing goes up too. And so a lot of times when that happens, that can trigger another recession. So it's it's a tough, and I don't envy the job of the Federal Reserve because they have to try to balance. Well, we need to bring inflation down, but the way that we do it also can harm the economy and bring us into a recession. Which the best way to combat a recession is to lower interest rates, and that's not good because that's that was one of the factors contributing to inflation. That and the fact that wages are also going because when wages go up. Due to costs going up, businesses got to pay more wages and benefits. But for that, but because everything we buy, we go to a restaurant, we eat out, the menu prices are going to go up. And then we have geopolitical factors affecting all of our prices too. There's a second war that just started, and we've had a war in Ukraine that's gone for a couple of years, and that's raising the price of fuel costs. And fuel costs affect transportation. It affects shipping for delivering all the goods that we buy, like in the store and in the grocery. And so those prices, those things go up. We've seen gas prices go down recently a little bit. So that's fortunate. But still, overall, things are pretty high. So all these things, these catalysts, earnings reports, geopolitical pressures, uh, interest rates, these are all of these factors that you want to have market awareness of. So that way it, it can make you think about uh, how this affects your investments and you can adjust your, your trading or your investing accordingly. So, so that's kind of what, what the market's been doing. Just uh, again, all about market awareness. So one of the first topics we'll, we have for this month is fundamental versus technical analysis. And anybody ever heard of that? Fundamental analysis, technical analysis? It's okay, a lot of people haven't, except finance people like me. So uh, all this is fundamental versus technical analysis is think of it as like two different ways of looking at how to analyze a stock that you want to invest in. So you basically have two different camps, uh, kind of a dichotomy. Fundamental analysts, they actually care what the company does. They care about whether it makes profits or revenues or not. They they look to see 
positive trends in their earnings or their revenues. So the fundamental analysis used the financial statements that the companies um, deliver. So the balance sheet, the income statement, statement exactly the same stuff we learned about in class. So they so fundamental investors they they look at these numbers and try to use these. Do I want to invest in this stock? Do I want to short this stock or not? So some examples, and there's dozens of different fundamental tools out there. I just give like a, a taste of it in this handout, PE ratio. This is probably one of the ones that the talking heads on TV use all the time. Means price to earnings ratio. So it's really just like, hey, come on in. Just sign up and get some handout right now. Glad you can make it. So it's basically the stock price divided by its earnings per share. And it kind of gives you a, a, a ballpark idea of whether a stock is overvalued or undervalued. So if, and you have to compare it to some sort of index or comparison, like, uh, like what is the PE ratio of the stock market? Or what is the PE ratio of an industry or uh, another competing company? So they use this a lot, like say if the average PE ratio of the stock market is 20 and the PE ratio of your particular stock you're interested in is 25, it may seem like your stock is overvalued. Or if the PE ratio of your stock is 15, maybe it seems like your stock is undervalued and it gets attractive to buy. But I'm not as sold on this particular ratio because it, it it could be a, a little misleading because it doesn't justify whether or not uh, the company's actual earnings make it worthwhile buying this stock. That's why I added another one in your handout uh, called the PEG ratio. So it takes that same PE ratio and it divides it by uh, what's the growth rate of the company. So, for example. Markets now that you want to control that to right. um, So, for example, I can actually just use the computer here. And if I could drag this cursor all the way to the other screen. Oh, here we go. Let me see if I could uh, pull up the path. Yay. All right. It's already here. So, Let's say, for example, it'd be easier to understand with numbers. So let's say um, we have a, a company like uh, Microsoft, and they have a PE ratio of uh, 30, which seems kind of high. And uh, there is but uh, Microsoft has a growth rate, I'm gonna divide it by the growth rate, of say 50%. Like their, their cloud services, their uh, AI services, uh, Xbox, because they just bought Activision, by the way, they're growing by leaps and bounds. And let's say their earnings are growing at 50% per year, really high growth rate. I'm just, man, I'm just making something up. So, that would give Microsoft a peg ratio of 0.6, which actually is undervalued. Anything less than one is usually considered relatively inexpensive. So what this tells us is uh, Microsoft stock is, act is actually, or stock price is justified because its growth rate is growing faster than how fast its stock price is growing. So Microsoft seems like a pretty good buy. Now, if, if you only used the PE ratio of Microsoft, which is 30, and compared it to the stock market, which is say you know, 20, then it would seem like Microsoft stock is overvalued. So that's why I say the PE ratio can sometimes be misleading because its growth rate and its revenues are justify why its stock price is so high. Uh, conversely, let's, say, let's take a look at, um, let's say, uh, Kellogg's. Oh, no, no, actually, no, let's do, um, let's do JCPenney's. So let's say JCPenney's has 
uh, a PE ratio of 15. And it looks like, oh man, JCPenney seems to be pretty cheap. But, but let's say that pennies, because there's so many competitors in retail for pennies, let's say that pennies revenues are only growing at 7% per year. So if I divide 15 divided by its anemic growth rate, then pennies has a peg ratio of two, which is very high. So 1.25, maybe even 1.5 is, is about as high as I want to go, but this is basically double. That means that penny stock price is actually overvalued because its growth rate isn't justifying how expensive its stock price is. Even though penny stock is seems pretty cheap, it's really not. And you can use this ratio with any stock. You can use it with you know, uh, small companies, large companies, uh, and, and you can just take a look. And, and all the information is, is publicly available. So it's an interesting um, fundal, fundamental analysis tool. Where do you find the growth rate? Growth rate on a company? Yeah, great question. Let me, um, let me pull up a web browser and... I can show you. What was the 15 number again on top when you divide 15? Oh, that that's the, the that was the PD ratio. Once you get to the web address. I would navigate to two screens to kind of view it. So P number over one is considered. Uh, well, it starts uh, being considered a little expensive, meaning that starts getting where the stock looks like it's overvalued. You can manually calculate a growth rate, but if if a website has already calculated one, let me just look at um, it's. Different ratios. Um, you look here. Here's earnings growth uh, year over year, twenty seven percent. So Microsoft has a has a pretty nice earnings growth rate. So for example, if uh, if Microsoft has a PE ratio of twenty five and they're growing at 27%, it's still going to be uh, a pretty attractive stock. So, but yeah, you can, you can pretty much look at earnings growth rate just by looking at the, um, the profile of the company on Yahoo Finance. So not too hard to find. Now, whether or not they actually calculate it right is, is another question, but you, you, you have to think that they probably uh, did a pretty good calculation for it. But again, you can actually look on the income statement, do your own calculation, just uh, calculate manually the growth rate of last year versus this year and see if, you know, how close theirs is, but, uh, the quarter by quarter, 27% year or year over year for comparing last quarters and this quarters, that's, that's pretty good. 27% sounds at least intuitively 27% growth rate sounds pretty good, but, uh, I'm not surprised because it's, it's Microsoft. Okay. So it's a little bit, again, there's a lot of different ones, uh, price to sales, price to book. You could do cash flow analysis. So all these things fall under the umbrella of fundamental analysis. You actually care about the numbers. You care about what they do. You care about growth rates and trends of the business. 
Now, let's go to the opposite, technical analysts. Technical analysts, uh, and, and I learned this from one, one of the best traders I love to follow, um, are product indifferent, meaning they don't care what the company does. They don't care if they're making money or not. They aren't even looking at the financial statement, really. Technical analysts, they all they look for is patterns. They are strictly focused on the movement of the actual stock. So patterns of the stock price going up and down. So uh, trend lines. So they'll they'll pull up a chart and they're taking a look to see if uh, they'll draw imaginary lines of borders and if the stock is moving up close to an upper border or a lower border to see if there's a breakthrough in where the stock is moving. Moving averages. They use. Uh, the 50 day moving average, the 100 day moving average, the 200 day moving average, and look for relationships on whether or not the stock is moving above or below those averages. One of the, uh, as I went to a technical training class, and one of the first things we learned on the first day was comparing the 50 day and the 200 day moving average. So if the 50 day moving average for a stock moves above the 200 day, then the relationship, like it's we can continue to move up. The move below the 200 day moving average, then that's a bearish signal. That means the stock has a higher probability of going down. There's momentum indicators. And I, I, I put three here, which you can look up RSI, stochastic, and uh, MACD. Basically, it's, it's like you can look at a uh, border and, and is the stock moving closer to the upper border or the lower border of, of a particular indicator? Uh, there's chart patterns. You can actually see if you draw a picture of where the stock has moved up and down over a period of a day or a year, you can look for patterns. Like, does it look, and I'm not kidding, does it look like a shoulder with a head on top or head and shoulders? Uh, does it have a double top or bottom? I mean, uh, a stock can hit, hit a peak twice before it starts going down, or does it hit a bottom price more than once before it starts trending back up. There's one uh, that's there's a triangle pattern where you can draw two imaginary lines and is the stock price starting to converge towards a particular point. Uh, there's a wedge. So there's oscillators uh, like Bollinger Bands. You can actually set up and there's free charting software that that you can use online. Although there's one you can pay for too. But these days, if you have any brokerage at all, a lot of them give these indicators uh, for you for free but with your trading platform. So you can you can use a lot of these. And again, the bottom line in technical trading, all this is just all based on looking at price movements. So regardless of what the company does, you're looking at price movements. Now, it's more of an art than a science. People will see patterns in the stock chart that other people may not see, or people might see a different pattern than you might. So it, it is kind of an art to it when you're doing technical trading. You, you, it, the best you can make do is really through experience. And the more you analyze these patterns, the better you are at identifying them over time. So it does take a lot of practice, and, uh, and that's why they have a lot of platforms that let you do paper trading. So that way you can start to teach yourself these, these patterns. But oh, I would say, why not do both? Why not use fundamental analysis and technical analysis? You can actually look at the numbers. You can actually look at the financial and hit company that you care to to study or invest in. But at the same time, all, you can also take a look at what the stock price is. Doing. I, and when I'm doing option trading, I, I am looking at oh, do I see the price going up and down? Do I see a trend? before I put in a trade. But then how I pick my companies is I actually will care about what they do, uh, new technology they come out with. Like if uh, NVIDIA dropped last week because uh, some news came out that the, the federal government is going to restrict how many chips that they could sell to China for security reasons. So uh, that temporarily dropped the stock price down significantly, like 20 bucks because uh, Investors were scared that NVIDIA might not be able to sell as many chips if they cut off the Chinese market from them. But then NVIDIA's CEO comes out a few days later and says, 
and we're not too worried about it. We're still going to sell a lot of chips because you know we we're like one of the leading um, creators of artificial intelligence chips out there. And so, and then they just made a deal with ARM Technologies, so, and the stock's been going back up. So, are the, are the uh, you know there's like some I forget what it is they talk about. They talk about like cannabis sticks. Yes, that is. Yeah, um, I teach the investment class, so we actually have a, a chapter on technical trading, which we we look at example of the candlesticks. Yes, that's exactly right, and that would fall under the the bucket of the technical tools. Yeah, yeah. there's so many out there. I, I I didn't want to include them all, but um, but yeah, candlestick charting is one of them. Uh, that is part of a technical tool, but actually, it's probably one of the most popular. Ones. So when I when I look at the day traders, I mean they're they're looking at candlestick charts all the time. And you interpret it by, you know, the length of the candle is, is like, um, and whether it's uh, as it's filled in with a dark or a light color will indicate whether the stock went up or down for the day. And the range of prices uh, will will dictate the length of that candle. So, but yeah, there's, uh, but yeah, that's one of the technical tools actually uh, that you could choose, you know, if you want to use that in in trading. There's a lot, isn't it? Yeah, you're talking <laughs> about like this chart, like this. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? so if, if you actually replace that um, that trend line with candlesticks, uh, then the, it'll look similar to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's uh, that's a little little primer on technical versus fundamental investing. Uh, one of the next ones. Last month, we actually uh, talked about. I, uh, the new yield max high yield ETFs or exchange traded funds and yield max funds have uh, are unique in that they sell uh, call options to generate their income. But what also makes the yield max ETFs unique that we talked about last month is that instead of focusing on a mutual fund like the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, they actually focus on just one individual stock. So there's an ETF for just Tesla. There's an ETF for just Microsoft, just NVIDIA, uh, just Netflix, just Meta. Um, and they, they've been coming out with a few more each month. They just came out with one for just JP Morgan and just Exxon Mobil and, um, and Coinbase. But I've been I've been buying a few of those. But uh, I wanted on um, on um, along the same lines of high yield ETFs. These two just came out last month. So I wanted to keep you guys on the cutting edge of uh, what's brand new in high yield. These two are called the Defiance High Yield ETFs. And I put the symbols up there for you to look up. Uh, one is JEPY and the other one is QQQY. And, uh, and here's what these two invest in. Um, and why these are different than some of the ones we talked about in last month's meeting. So JEPY and QQQY, most of what they invest in, uh, the bulk of what they invest in is actually in cash. They're in treasuries and they keep a small percentage, maybe 25% or less uh, that they use to trade. So that way it keeps the risk low is that they, and this, these are the first funds to do it, they sell out of the money call option puts, basically like insurance contracts, to generate monthly income for their investors. And besides that fact, they sell these option contracts, basically insurance contracts, uh, with expiration expirations of zero days, meaning that every single day they'll sell a contract at 9 a.m. probably when the market opens or whatever, sometime during the day, and they will automatically expire at 4 p.m. that afternoon on any given market day. And the reason why it's an interesting strategy is that as long as the trade works and the contract expires, all the money that they collect as premium, they get to keep all of it. Mm. So so that's so the the profit that they generate can be quite high. For example, and I looked these up yesterday, uh, these pay a monthly dividend. So last month was the first month that they paid a dividend per share. 
So for the JEPY, uh, they invest in um, options on the index of the standard and Poor's 500, so the 500 million stocks. So, so very diverse. And they paid 90 cents a share uh, for their dividend. The, the asset value is $18.60 a share. So that should be close to what the stock to or the ETF is selling for. Uh, I'm going to show you how that translates into well, one of my earnings uh, in, in a second. The QQQY, uh, again, has a similar strategy, except instead of the 500 biggest stocks in the S&P 500, they invest in what's called the NASDAQ 100, which are the 100 biggest tech stocks. So all of your known names, you know, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Netflix, uh, Meta, uh, those are all in, in the top 100. And last month, for their first dividend, was $1.10 per share. So, and keep in mind, that's pretty high for a dividend, and for especially for a dividend that pays once a month. But I'm going to show you. Uh, let's let's look at what the stock's selling for right now. It might be down because the market's down today. Market's down today, so yeah, it's down 16 cents. So, uh, so not an expensive stock. $18.56 per share. Uh, I mean, I bought I bought several shares of this and the QQQY last month. So it's down 16 cents, so not too bad. But um, and then the QQQY, what's it selling for today? It's probably down to because the market's down. Yeah, it's down 30 cents today. So $18.32 for the QQQY. So what's uh what the reason why this is attractive to a lot of investors right now is the yield. And so let me just refresh for all my students here. How do we calculate yield? Uh, think of yield as like what you would get like in your savings account. I mean, what interest rate we get on our savings. So instead, this is going to be the rate that we're getting if we invested in the stock. So what the, the yield is calculated as the cash dividend that they pay you divided by what the stock price is. So I think the JEPY paid uh, 90 cents per share. And it's selling for selling for 1856. Okay, so I'm going to take this 90 cents and divide it by 18 dollars and 56 cents. So this month, uh, that is a if you remember from middle school math, just move the decimal points over. That's a 4.8 percent return uh, for this month which is pretty darn good. So that 90 cents translates to 4.8% interest for this month. Because again, it's the 90 cents divided by the stock price. The QQQY, so if I take, and again, there's no guarantee you're always gonna get these, these payments at high. They could go up and down every month, but uh, last month was a pretty good, a pretty nice payment. So $1.10 divided by, what the stock price is, so let's 1832. That's a 6% interest rate for this month. Uh, and again, that's that's pretty high. I mean, a lot of people would be happy to get 6% on their CD for the entire year. So you can kind of see why these, these, uh, these defiance ET, high yield ETFs are pretty attractive. So this is per month. Per month, yes. Which is again, that's why that's why I bought shares. But yeah. So um, the financial institution views on this like oh so yeah, so all all the big all the largest financial you got like your your JP Morgan's, your Chase, your Bank of America's. Uh, your city banks, they all use uh, options to hedge their assets. As a matter of fact, um, you guys heard of Warren Buffett, he's the one of the richest man in the world. So if you look at his annual statement uh, or his annual report for Berkshire Hathaway, which is a company 
that he owns. And the notes of the financial statements, uh, a lot of people don't realize it. Besides the fact that he's, he picks great companies and invests in them for the long term, a good portion of the income from Berkshire Hathaway stock actually also comes from options. So all the major financial institutions do this to protect their assets. They will, they will actually pay with options. And again, as individual investors, we can do the same, just on the smallest. Well, my question, which I guess is what a group project comes in, mm -hmm. is how do they, how do they pull all these different numbers to say, okay, by or we expect Oh, like the, like these two in particular. Yeah, like so we're, yeah. So what they'll do is they they have an idea about based on how much cash that they want to use to back up uh, these trades. Uh, they can project how much income that they can uh, reasonably get, and the main driver of how much they can get is volatility. So the more volatile the stocks they invest in, the more premium they can sell it for. So if stocks aren't as volatile, then they can sell for less premium, they can generate less income. Uh, but they're safe. So there's a trade-off, higher risk, high reward. Like uh, one of the ETFs we talked about last month, um, TSLY based on Tesla, uh, they can sell their premiums up for a lot more because Tesla's stock is more volatile. So versus say like um, Apple, which APL, APLY, Apple, that stock's not as volatile, so it won't generate as much income. Although the income is so attractive, it's just not gonna be as much as Tesla. If you just have to be willing to uh, accept the fact that there's gonna be more volatility in the price going up and down in exchange for the higher returns. Uh, that being said, let me actually illustrate that. Let's take a look at Tesla. So this is one of the yield max ETFs that we talked about in last month's meeting. So it's down 3%, 11, 11 bucks a share. So here's 31% return for the year, which is pretty good. But let me look at what the dividend was last month. Tesla, 3%. Here we go. NASDAQ's a good a good site to look at dividend history. All right. So last month they paid fifty six, or this month they paid fifty seven cents a share. The month before they paid eighty three cents. July they paid a uh, dollar six per share, eighty cents so forth. So again. More volatile, but also uh, again, high payouts, low payouts. It, it's it's not consistent, but it, uh, because Tesla is a more volatile stock, it results in those higher payouts. Or, no, no ads. Uh, and, and then I'll compare it to. You'll see the difference between Apple. Apple's not as volatile stock, but their payouts are probably they're lower but more consistent. So you would think that. So yeah, to get to there. get what the yield is for that particular month. Yeah. So whatever the stock price was that month, you would divide it by or you divide that into the actual cash payout for that month. So here's Apple's dividend history. Uh, again, these are lower than Tesla's or Tesla's, but they're more consistent. They're they're a little closer. They aren't moving as up and down like from 40 cents to a dollar like Tesla's was. But uh, the yield is is lower. It's like about 20% lower, but uh, but I still like Apple, so I, I, I put in, I, I'm diversified in, in a lot of these high yield um, ETFs. But yeah, these are the these are the ones we talked about uh, last month's, and uh, I had a handout for uh, all the new yield max ones. But uh, they, they use a, a similar strategy, but instead of selling put options, they sell call options. And unlike the defiance ones that I, I'm introducing to you today. These these aren't zero day expirations. So, but uh, 
But again, very interestingly attractive yields for for some of these. You know, if, if you if you have a, a higher tolerance for risks and uh, and you're seeking a higher percentage payout on your dividend stocks, then uh, these two uh, groups, the yield max and the defiance ones, are interesting interesting choices. Uh, when I'm receiving uh, when I'm receiving the the dividends, actually, uh, I'm actually reinvesting them all. Oh, thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Jeremy. Hope to see you next time. Uh, oh, yeah, what was I? Oh, yeah, <laughs> reinvest the dividends. So as I receive the dividends each month, which is, again, one of the attractiveness of these types of stocks, because most stocks pay dividends quarterly. I like these because these pay monthly. I mean, coincide when you have to pay your bills, which is kind of nice. But when, but I take 100% of all the income from these high dividend paying in ETFs, and I reinvest them in buying more shares. So I'll take all the money they pay me, and I take and I buy more and more shares. But I don't automatically reinvest them in the same ones. I'll spread them out into a lot of the different ETFs. Uh, especially if some are down and on a particular day, then I'll buy them when they're cheap. Uh, or, or if like I have more of one of these versus another one, I'll kind of balance it out so I, so they kind of spread out evenly. So, uh, so a couple of different different factors. You said all these are new the, uh, options. Yeah, the uh, the yield max ones have been around since last fall of twenty two. Uh, and the defiance ones are totally brand new. So again, you know, just take it with a grain of salt. Uh, you, you, you can maybe want to watch and see how they can make, if they can maintain their dividends. They only have one month worth of data, which isn't really that much. I, I took the lead and, and bought some ahead of time so I can capture uh, the October, or no, the uh, November dividend for the two um, defiance ones. But it wouldn't have a PEG number because it's new. It wouldn't have a PE number. Uh, actually, it wouldn't have a, uh, an earnings number because it doesn't manufacture anything. Uh, it's actually not a company. It's it's actually just a financial institution that uh, comes up with the ETFs for investors. So unlike a, a, a company that that will actually create something, the, these uh, high yield ETFs that that's actually their business is just creating vehicles. So they're a financial institution, like an investment bank, for example. Yeah, that growth comes from. Uh, yeah, the growth. The, yeah, the growth is basically um, now. I guess. I guess the growth would come from how much they can grow the. The earnings they receive from selling the option premiums, you could you could calculate a growth rate based on that. And again, uh, their their monthly financial should. Uh, or will reflect, since they're public any, anyway, um, reflect how much cash they've been able to collect each month. And you can manually calculate what that growth rate is. So, so yeah, you can you can actually mathematically co compute uh, a PE or a PEG uh, on your own based on how they generate the income from selling those option contracts. So I found it really fascinating and uh, and compelling to actually put my own money into it. So. But I wanted to, as I always do, share with the club, uh, you know, the latest, latest and greatest. So uh, before we head out, um, just want to see if we had any questions. But again, thank you so much. And uh, I'll make sure as long as you're on the email list or I can read your email uh, when the next meeting is. It's usually going to be the third or the fourth weekend or week of every month uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday based on my speaking schedule. So. Uh, it's always going to be here for the daytime meeting and in the evening over at South Campus. Uh, and Harold made both. <laughs> he, was, he was at the meeting at South last night. Oh, here in the evening. Yeah, yes, it is. <laughs> and again, if you, if you have guests, uh, feel free to bring them. Yes, always welcome. Like, if I'm good, we would have yeah. been there. I had, uh, when, I, when I used to do the, uh, the Beaver Campus evening meetings, I had um, mom spring bring their kids so they can learn about investing. I thought that was, that was great. So, I mean, again, it's all it's all useful information. I know. So, thank you for coming. Let me uh log off and I'll try to upload the
the video recording.